Nevada Practices Policy Committee to order. Today is Tuesday, March 8th, 2022. And we have three bills on our agenda today. First up is Senate File 182 uh, from Senator Rarick. So Senator Rarick, welcome to the committee and feel free to begin your testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Uh, Senate File 182 is a continuation of some work that we did in the legislature in 2017. Uh, quick little history, um, when the Minsher system rolled out and people were encouraged to go online to uh, apply, if you qualified for MA, you were automatically enrolled in the system without being given an option. The other thing that happened is people who were 55 to 65 that were automatically enrolled in MA were not told that because of the help they were getting on their premiums and other coverages, liens were being put on their properties. Um, a group of people, uh, a true grassroots uh, group of citizens uh, discovered this and began working. And uh, two of the folks who spearheaded that are here to testify today and they're from my district. And then Senator Lori and I worked on this and got the legislation passed in 2017 to forgive the liens on their properties because they had never been given notification. And in the story um, that Mr. Rayburn will tell as well, um, when he asked about paying off that lien, he was told there are no provisions to pay them off. They will be collected from your estate when you die. So again, in 17, the legislature forgave those liens. The problem is all of that information still exists and sits out there today at DHS. What Senate File 182 looks to do is to remove that information from the record so that the people who have these liens over their heads do not have to fear that a future legislature or administration will try to once again institute those liens and collect those uh, upon their deaths. So. Um, we have been trying to work with the agency as far as um, determining can the names just be separated from the information? Is there a time period where we could um, have this specifically, whether it's in 2025, eliminate everything or 2027? Um, but I, we believe that uh, as the bill is written right now to separate the names from the data it is doable and would appreciate the uh, the committee's support. And I, with that, I would be um, happy to turn it over to my testifiers. Thank you, Senator Rarick. So I have Mr. Rick Rayburn and Mr. Scott Kilrood on the list to testify. I believe you're both online. Uh, is there one of you that was planning to go first before the other? Since I'm sitting in front of the video, I guess I could go first. Okay, Mr. Rayburn, uh, welcome to the committee. If you would please identify yourself first on the record and then feel free to begin your testimony. Welcome. Now, thank you, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Rick Rayburn from Finlayson, Minnesota, and I'm here in support of Bill SF-182. Um, just one point that uh, it is Mr. Killerood who tried to pay the, the, uh, the debt off, and so he will cover that in his testimony. Uh, okay, so then I will continue. Without this bill's passage, the estates of tens of thousands of Minnesotans will remain indefinitely compromised by the unwarranted threat of Medicaid estate recovery. Who are these people? They are grandparents, often single grandmothers, early retirees, small farmers and small business owners, frugal people with humble households. I've had encounters with many of them over these last years. They are your elderly neighbors. Those affected applied for insurance through Minsure and were, as Jason said, diverted to the Medicaid program. They signed up in good faith, believing that they would share in the benefits of reduced health insurance costs advertised by the Affordable Care Act and the Minsure application. However, these people were not informed in any way by Minsure or the Minnesota Department of Human Services that if they were 55 years old or older, they would be expected to repay upon death all Medicaid expenses provided them. This includes insurance premiums, often amounting to many thousands of dollars per year. Then why weren't these enrollees informed of the threat of recovery? 
That question has never been satisfactorily answered. There were certainly many provisions in place for warning prospective applicants of this threat, such as the following. In February of 2014, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services sent a letter to the state Medicaid director advising that the state limit recoveries for new enrollees to only long-term support services, which would be nursing home and related. There's a Minnesota statute, 256B.04, subdivision eight, that the state should furnish information to the public regarding the plan for medical assistance of the state. There is the state Medicaid manual, which states that federal law requires all states to incorporate the following protection for Medicaid recipients into their estate recovery plan. That is that every state should notify Medicaid recipients about the estate recovery program during their initial application for Medicaid. Had that law been obeyed, we wouldn't be here today. Then there's contract law for the definiteness of a contract, which requires that all essential terms of an agreement be agreed upon before the contract may be accepted or enforced. Also of relevance here is that the MinSure application states that information provided in an application for coverage through MinSure may be kept up to 10 years. And that's explicitly 10 years in the application with obvious exceptions for long-term support services, which have to be kept indefinitely. This disregard for federal, state, and civil laws and recommendations implies that the Minnesota Department of Human Services had no consideration for the protection of the enrollee's assets or their long-term peace of mind. The breach of public trust was bad enough. However, if the claim histories referred to in this bill are kept indefinitely, those victimized must spend the rest of their lives wondering if this injustice will revisit them in the future through a state or federal law change. A 2016 and 17 law, which Jason mentioned, which currently halts this recovery, cannot permanently remove that threat as was its intent. The possibility of recovery renders estate planning for these people moot. With Medicaid estate recovery on the rise nationwide, the threat to these estates becomes more and more likely as time goes on. The only remedy for this situation is removal of personal data from the Minnesota Department of Human Services database. Only then will the threat of recovery for a debt that was never agreed to be resolved. Passage of SF-182 would restore these estates to their pre-2014 status, that is, free of potentially recoverable Medicaid histories, thereby undoing the exploitation of this most vulnerable group and its concurrent concealment. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Rayburn. Uh, appreciate your testimony. So next is uh, Mr. Scott Kilrood. Okay, and we'll do a quick curtain switch here. Oh, okay, you're in the same room together. Perfect. Mr. Kilrood, welcome to the committee. Uh, same thing for you as well. If you would introduce yourself for the record and then uh, feel free to begin your testimony. Thanks for being here this afternoon. Hello, Chairman and committee members. I'm Scott Kilrood from Willow River, Minnesota. My wife, Ellen, and I are among a group of 80,000 Minnesotans aged 55 and over who unwittingly got caught in the 2014 Minsure medical assistance trap. We had evidently incurred Uh, Mr. Kilrood, your screen went on mute. Are you able to unmute yourself? Mr. Kilrood, I think you muted yourself. Here we go. All righty. Uh, need to back up about 30 seconds or so. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, we had evidently incurred estate claims simply by complying with the rules of the new Affordable Care Act to sign up for health insurance via MNsure. In 2016, Assistant DHS Commissioner Nathan Morocco assured us, quote, estate recovery is not intended to be punitive, unquote. At that time, I offered to write back to DHS for the full amount they said we owed to finally get this business behind us. I was told there is no lien on our estate until both Ellen and I die. You can't pay it off. Since that time, our small bunch of average folks have been able to reduce the threat of predatory estate recovery through several legislative accomplishments, yet these recovery amounts in our names still strangely persist as DHS data. What possible reason could DHS have for maintaining this list of names unless it was indeed to punish us with that data somewhere down the line. I understand that the dollar amounts might be useful for statistical analysis, but there should be no reason to keep these honest citizens' names on file. I urge support of Senate File 182 to strike these names from DHS data files and put an end to this years long debacle. Thank you, Chair and committee members. Thank you, Mr. Kilrood. Uh, appreciate your testimony. Um, Senator Rarick, I believe that's all the testifiers you had. Correct. Is there anyone else that uh, wanted to testify on this bill? Um, seeing none, we'll go to questions from committee members. First is Senator Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, appreciate the opportunity. It's it's pressed. Sorry about that. It was pressed before. Technology. <laughs> God bless technology. <laughs> Take two, Senator Anderson. Um, question I have, have, I'm concerned about is that Senator Rarick mentioned that we passed this legislation to take these people's names and have them off the roll as far as not having to pay back to DHS any amount of money for the Affordable Care Act or Minsure while we're talking about. My concern is, will there be some type of a report uh, to let us know that this has actually happened. I mean, it's similar to what you just, Senator Eric, you just said that we passed it and then it's still sitting out there. What, what's going to let us know that this is actually completed and happened? Senator Eric. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, the, the other legislation only forgave the liens. It, it missed the detail about removing their names from the record. That's why we're following up with this. And it would be my intention to continue to, once this would be passed and signed, uh, to continue uh, on the agency to make sure they follow through and, and take care of that. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so Senator Eric, I was just wondering if there's a, and maybe staff can help, as far as putting some type of amendment on here to say this, this report, there's a report that has to come back to the legislature or to you, Ms. Um, Mr. Senator Rarick, uh, to say this has been completed. I mean, why not do it now rather than wait and be sitting waiting as we've waited two years now to say, you know, these names haven't been removed and so forth and on. Just question and uh, thoughts for staff. Senator Rarick first, and then I'll go to Senate Council. Senator Rarick. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I would uh, be very open to that. And uh, we are going to HHS. So um, like we, I can work with staff to get the something, an amendment drafted to put on there that would say that the DHS has to report back to the legislature when the work has been completed. I'd, I'd be happy to do that. Mr. Chair. Senator Anderson. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think we should, uh, uh, Senator Eric, uh, put a date specific on that, that amendment uh, when you work with staff and DHS, uh, although the next committee, because uh, this can get drug out for ever. Thank you. 
Thank you, Senator Anderson. Uh, Ms. Primo, uh, do you have any advice for us at this time? Is this uh, in your area of expertise or would this be best for uh, counsel for HHS? Mr. Chair and members, that's up to the committee members and um, Senator Rarick, we can work on this offline with HHS counsel um, or I could prepare language now. Uh, it's really up to the committee members. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Primo, would it take that long to put a, an amendment like that together right now? Ms. Primo. Mr. Chair and Senator Anderson, um, I'd probably just need about another minute if that would be okay. That'd okay. be great. I'll go to if there are any other questions while uh, Ms. Primo works on that. Members, are there any other questions? Senator Latz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I wonder if we have any input from DHS on whether uh, they think this is lawful under federal law uh, to delete this data um, and whether there are any other consequences to deleting the data that haven't been presented by the bill's proponents. We have a couple members of DHS on the Zoom screen. They indicated they would be on just in case uh, they wanted to answer any questions. So I'd invite either of them, uh, whoever uh, feels prepared to answer that question to uh, pop up on the Zoom screen. Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, please identify them. yourself. Oh, there you are. Ms. Bobs, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, Ann Bots with the department. Um, as written, we do not believe we can comply with this based on federal law. We do have federal requirements for both a timeline for data retention um, based on the type of data, as well as a requirement that the state Medicaid agency, which is DHS in Minnesota, maintains the records necessary for operation of the program and for the periods required by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Additionally, a state recovery is governed both under state and federal law. Um, and because of the requirement uh, to carry out a state recovery, we cannot, we cannot deliberately destroy data necessary to carry out this requirement. Um, and I can't say for sure if there would be any consequences, but there are, have been times where the federal government will look to recoup federal funds from the state if we're not in compliance with federal law. Senator Latz. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ms. Bobst. Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with this area, so you may just need to educate me. Um, in on the scenarios that have been described by the testifiers, are there estate recoveries that are uh, anticipated to happen um, in these cases for which data would need to be uh, maintained? Or is this just a matter of no longer really needed data um, that is just residing in the DHS systems because of federal requirements. Ms. Bobst. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Lads. I think I might defer to my colleague, Geneva Finn, on this question. She's a little more in the weeds on a state recovery process than myself. I missed the name of who you're passing it to. Mr. Chair, that would be Geneva Finn. Finn. Mr. Ms. Chair, Finn. Oh, sorry, Mr. Chair, for the record, my name is Geneva Finn. I'm the manager of the Special Recovery Unit in Healthcare for the Department of Human Services. We anticipate no estate recovery for these individuals. It would be a violation of Minnesota state law. Um, we don't have records on recoverable estates on these individuals within um, the special recovery unit. The data that the department maintains is historical data on claims that have been paid and eligibility. Um, and those are um, used for other purposes, not for state recovery. Senator Lance. So it, it sounds like what we're dealing with here is, is only historical data that doesn't have any 
uh, future application um, for purposes of the situations described by the testifiers, but is being retained in the DHS systems because uh, federal law requires the data to be retained just because the, they do. Um, and uh, if, if that's the case, um, well, I guess two things. One is, you know, I, I understand people don't like data being kept on them for no apparent reason. Um, but it sounds like as a practical matter, there isn't any real practical consequence of this data being retained. Um, unless I'm missing something here. Um, and then secondly, we run the risk of, well, we would be in violation of federal uh, code of federal regulations, federal law. I think that's 45 CFR 155.1210 and uh, 42 CFR 431.17. Uh, there may be something in 42 U.S. Code 1396P as well, at least according to the background information I've received. Um, now whether the feds would take any action on it or not is, you know, unknown, but I'm not comfortable necessarily placing the state knowingly and intentionally in violation of federal law and, and maybe risking some response by them. But I, I'd be glad to be corrected if any of, of what I've said is inaccurate. But um, if I'm understanding it correctly, the testifiers here seem to be most concerned or, or as a practical matter, they're concerned about just the fact that DHS is maintaining data because uh, it doesn't sound like as a practical matter there's any other consequence of that data being in the system. Thank you, Senator Latz. Ms. Finn, if I could ask a clarifying question of you. You mentioned about um, the estate recovery violating Minnesota law currently. Is that the um, 2016 or 17 law that Senator Rarick mentioned in his testimony that he and Senator Lori worked on at that time, or is there something additional? No, Mr. Chair, you are correct. Uh, so, Ms. Finn, would it be true to say that if a future legislature decided to uh, reverse that law, that that would clear the way for your agency to move forward with estate planning at that time, if, if that hypothetically happened in the future? Mr. Chair, my agency follows the laws the legislature directs, you know, as the legislature writes the law. Um, so we follow the law when we remove the state recovery for those populations. Um, we would follow the law for individuals in the future. There are some legal complications. There would be legal complications with the legislature retroactively implementing a state recovery for those populations that would probably cause us to have some concerns and come to the legislature, um, particularly regarding the issue of due, up, due process and retroactive application of laws. And I'm not quite sure um, what how the courts would, um, whether or not the courts would allow us to do a state recovery on those populations. Okay, that's helpful to know. Thank you. Uh, Senator Rarick, did you have a uh, follow-up answer on this? Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think um, one of the things we've been trying to get at um, with this legislation is, one, we have recognized that there are some records that need to be kept. Um, the, the, this bill is asking that the names be removed from the records. We believe that the retention of the data itself um, can be done without the names being attached to it. Um, but as I stated earlier too, um, it would be acceptable that if we were to determine that say it's seven years or 10 years that the data has to be retained, that th there would be an assurance given that at that period of time, all the data would be destroyed. And um, in one of the documents um, that the agency had sent to Mr. Rayburn, it does state that there is an ability to destroy records um, by shredding paper and permanently uh, removing electronic files. So, I mean, data, there is a point in time uh, for sure that the data can be eliminated. And, and these folks in their conversations with people at the agencies have heard that the, the data exists and there is the potential and it is at this point would be held indefinitely. And that is what we want to address with 
this legislation to make sure that does not happen. Thank you, Senator Rick. Uh, is there any more discussion or questions from members? Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Senator Latz. Um, I guess I want, I'd like to hear from DHS whether this data would be held indefinitely or if there's some other provision already in statute that requires the destruction of data after the federal retention period has expired. Ms. Finn, do you want to take that or should we call on uh, <coughs> one of your colleagues? Um, Mr. Chair, I would not be prepared to answer that in a way that would give you good information. Uh, Ms. Bobs, do you have an answer at this point? Mr. Chair, Senator Letts, I would have to take that question back. Um, I, we do comply with you know the laws related to estate recovery and data retention. There are some exception documents that we have to keep for certain periods of time to comply with federal law. Um, however, I would have to follow up uh, with members after the fact. Senator Lance. So I guess I'm a little bit confused here what this bill is requiring. Is this bill proposed to require the removal of names? And I guess if, but nothing else. And if that's the case, I'd ask DHS to indicate whether removing the names would bring it out of compliance with federal requirements or whether they must also keep the names along with the other data. So I guess that's the first question. Senator Rarick, do you wanna answer to the bill's purpose first? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, it is my understanding that the point of the bill as written is to remove the names from the records. And then Ms. Bobst or Ms. Finn, do you wanna answer um, the second part of that question on federal compliance of just removing names? <coughs> Ms. Bob. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Lett, uh, we do not believe that removing the names will allow us to stay in compliance with federal law. Um, however, we do not interpret the bill as written to apply only to closed cases, and that would be problematic to delete names for cases that may remain open. Mr. Chair. Senator, Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, point. I, the last testifier, I could make out about every other word she was saying. I wonder if she could Ms. Uh, Bob, get closer to her microphone or if maybe she's got a bad connection. Just, I wasn't able to clearly hear what she, she indicated, if she could restate that, please. Okay, Ms. Bobs, did you uh, repeat your last answer for Senator Westrom's benefit? Well, yes, Mr. Mr. Chair. I hope it's Senator for the whole committee. I, I wasn't able to hear it. Maybe everybody else was, but I hope it helps other people too. So. Thank you, Ms. Bobst. Thank you, Mr. Chair, is that better? I believe so, yes, go ahead. Sure, so as I was saying, I, we do not believe that we can delete identifying data such as the name and remain in compliance with federal law. But as we interpret the language as written, it would not apply only to closed cases, it would also apply to cases that remain open and that presents a further issue. Thank you, Ms. Bobst. Mr. Chairman. Senator Latz. I'm reading the bill. Fortunately, it's a short bill, so I can read it quickly here. Um, and I don't see anything in the bill that purports to limit the data that's required to be destroyed to names only. There's nothing in the bill that says names only. Um, and I don't see anything that limits the bill only to closed cases. Um, it just says all medical assistance welfare data collected during a certain time period and then identifies certain individuals. Um, so uh, I, I sounds like the bill would put the state out of compliance with federal requirements, um, which is not really a good place to be when you're dealing with medical assistance data. The feds are pretty pretty tough sticklers about this stuff if they do an audit. Um, and uh, and it's, it sounds like there's no practical consequence to the data being retained. Maybe I'd ask the testifiers because uh, I'm not 
sure I understood what they had to say about that because they, they were raising much bigger issues in their testimony. I'm not clear if, if those are issues that remain or those are issues that are, you know, kind of generated their interest in this topic and have caused them to try to move in this direction, but no longer as a practical matter exists. Maybe the testifiers could help clarify that too. Uh, would Mr. Raver and Mr. Killerud wish to respond to that? I'd be glad to. All right, um, feel free, go ahead. Okay, Mr. Raber here. Um, Mr. Raber. The reason, thank you, Chair. Uh, the reason for removing this data is because we had confirmation from both the Minnesota Department of Human Services via a phone call by myself with Geneva Finn that she informed me that if Minnesota were to reinstate this law, it in fact would go retroactive and that our estates would be again in jeopardy. We also had conversations, and I believe you have some uh, documents that were from Kathy Sturgill at uh, CMS, and she confirmed that if Minnesota reinstates the 55 clawback, as it's called, that yes, it would go retroactive and we would be liable for these claims. Also, if the federal government uh, were to mandate this uh, for basic health care, as they did in 1993 for long-term services, you know, nursing home, federal mandate, they would look back at to the time period that what the law was in effect when our uh, claims were made. And if the law was in effect during that time period, then they would be recoverable. So since the law was in effect when our claims were made, then the federal government would assume that they were valid and recover those. So in two cases, state or federal law, if, if the laws change, we will be ended up responsible for paying these debts off upon our death through our estate. So Mr. Chairman, Lance. so if I'm understanding Mr. Rayburn correctly, it sounds like he's, he's trying to protect himself and others in this situation from being identifiable in the event that the state were to pass a new law sometime in the future, presumably within the 10 year look back period for the, or the retention period required by federal law. Um, so, I mean, if, if the legislature in its, you know, in, in its process were to decide that we wanted to pass a law to undo what was passed before and to do so still understanding the potential retroactive application that might capture uh, estates in the situation that Mr. Rayburn and Mr. Killerud are in. And we still think that's something that we want to pass into law and the governor agrees and signs it. Um, sounds like Mr. Rayburn wants to make sure data relating to him and others in this situation aren't there for the law that we theoretically could pass in the future to apply to. This is, it, this is a really awkward situation to be asking us to do here. Because um, not only would it put us in violation of federal law, um, but it's completely hypothetical based on some future legislature that may or may not pass a law to undo what we've already done. And if we were to pass such a law, it would be with the intention. Uh, if we included a retroactivity provision or didn't exclude its retroactive application, it would be with the intention of going back to this existing cases and, and I guess, uh, reinstating that process. So um, I'm not sure that we ought to be in a position of helping people shield themselves from the actions of the future legislature in the event that the future legislature would do that. Um, but I mean, I understand their concerns and they want to protect themselves and I don't, I don't begrudge that, but I'm not sure that we as a legislature should be party to deleting data just in case some future legislature decides they want to do something for which that data would be uh, 
uh, relevant and put us in violation of federal law in the process. Thank you, Senator Latz. Uh, next, Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I hope you can hear me. I'm in kind of a, a bad spot here, but just wanted to uh, know, maybe from DHS, uh, do you know, is there a way to quantify the liability that we have outstanding based on those potential claims, um, you know, that, that we forgave or, or weren't seeking? Ms. Bobst or Ms. Venn, who would like to take that? Mr. Chair, um, members of the committee, there's no current liability outstanding because there's no estate recovery applicable to those um, individuals. Senator Johnson. Yeah, thank you. Maybe um, I should be a little bit more clear. Back when the law was passed, was there any sort of fiscal note at that time to say how much uh, potential there was um, based on you know, the potential liability or recovery that we may have uh, based on that forgiveness or you know, the outstanding potential liability, is what I'm saying, not the actual liability? Ms. Finn. There was a fiscal note attached, Mr. Chair. Um, I We don't have it with us right now and we'd have to refer back to it and get that information to you later. Senator Johnson. Mr. Chair, I would appreciate that. If you could email that to the committee, uh, that'd be helpful too. Thank you, Senator Johnson. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, uh, I guess to one of the department uh, witnesses first, um, to the issue about being out of federal compliance, uh, I'm not convinced your, of your testimony or not clear maybe is the better way to say it, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, so are you, are you emphatically 100% telling us that this bill would be contrary to federal law and cannot be done. That's maybe the basic question I've got for you. I, I didn't, I didn't fully understand that. Ms. Bobst, I believe, was answering some of those questions. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Westrom. We do need to comply with federal requirements for data retention policies. And if we delete data that does not, that is still under those federal retention requirements, that would be in violation of federal law. Senator Westrom. So, Mr. Chair, to the author, Senator Rarick, um, in, in preparing and working on this bill, has that been your understanding of this bill is? We can't go forward with it, even though we've got the draft because there's a federal law strictly prohibiting uh, this data. Uh, can you square any of that for me? Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Westrom. Um, you know, like, this is one of the things we've been trying to get at um, all along is, is there a way to separate the names only? Is there a time specific seven years, 10 years, that we could put into here to make sure this gets done. And uh, we have never been given a clear answer to those questions to this point. Um, we get a lot of, we believe, or we think this is what it is, but we've never been given a definite answer. And that's why we've been uh, pushing forward. And I do, um, as reading the bill, I was under the impression, and I'm sorry, my memory uh, was wrong. Um, I thought we had put it into the bill last year in the HSR committee to separate the names from the data, but as reading the bill, yes, it is still all the data. Um, but we are open to whatever will work to give the, these people comfort that they're going to be protected. Um, and that's, I, I think that's the whole point. As a legislature in 2017, we agreed that what was done was wrong. And when we give get more time and get further away from that, 
uh, a different legislature could decide if there's a, a budget deficit that they wanna go back after this. And I think it's our responsibility to say, no, you cannot go back after it. We made a decision in 17 and we're going to make sure we're protecting those people. That's the point of the legislation. And uh, Mr. Chair. Senator Westrom. Um, and, and thank you, uh, Senator Rarick. Um, and if there's a way to draft that amendment or, or have it done to what we're thinking it was, I, I, I'd be open to moving that or somebody else on the committee might, uh, if that's how we comply. Uh, back to the department. Um, can, can you give us specific citations of what you're saying is not allowed by federal law to remove either the name or, and or the data? Because uh, I'm getting the same feeling from your testimony as Senator Rarick just said, it's feeling a little squishy to me. And I, I wanna know specifically, uh, citation, specific words that tell you this is prohibited under federal law. Ms. Bobst. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Westrom. So a few citations that we have looked at in reviewing this bill, we do have 45 CFR 155.1210, which requires a 10 year retention period for medical assistance files uh, 42 CFR 431.17 is the statute that requires the state Medicaid agency to maintain the records necessary for operation of the program. Uh, and a state recovery itself is required under 42 USD 1396P. Would you, repeat your, would, you re would you repeat your second citation again? 42 CFR and what was followed? Four. Mr. Chair, 43, it's 42 CFR 431.17. And, and Mr. Chair, Senator if, Westford. If, if the witness could follow that up with an email to uh, the committee, maybe the committee administrator, uh, your staff, Mr. Chair, with the specific language that you're targeting as the concern or question, I think that would be helpful. Um, and, and, and to the witness, are you saying separating the name from the data is not uh, something we could do either? Uh, Ms. Bobst. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom. Yes, I'd be happy to follow up with that information. Um, I've been told by our staff that separating out the name would be likely operationally difficult and also likely would not comply with that federal law. Okay, so Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, uh, have you specifically looked at it and came up with that conclusion, or are you just rely? You, you mentioned you've been told by staff. I think this rises to a little more level of uh, getting yourself or others that really know this involved to to develop this. Uh, we need more than an "I think." I is what I'm I'm thinking. This bill. Uh, is about so specifically to you do you have you looked it over and is that your 100 percent conclusion or is there a little bit of maybe left in there and it's just that it would be difficult to operationalize but you probably could do it but uh, if it's difficult to operationalize you, you don't want to do it Ms. Bobst Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom. I certainly am not the expert in this area, so I defer to the expertise of our policy staff. Um, I personally have not delved deeply into those statutes. I've relied on the expertise of our policy staff to bring these concerns to my to our attention. So Senator Mr. Westrom. Mr. Chair, uh, thank you. I, I, think, I think if in your position, maybe we need to get just a little deeper dug into this, but um, Mr. Chair, I, I think this is a good reason why we bring bills to committee. Um, uh, let's, let's dig into this harder. Um, but I guess I just want to offer a, an opposite view of what Senator Latz was maybe trying to argue earlier. Um, I don't think it's government's responsibility to collect data and create lists of all our constituents 
only to keep it on file so it's convenient for government to uh, take or if they decide to do something that wouldn't necessarily be in constituents, private landowners, private property owners, individual voters, uh, the, the we, the people of our government, uh, keep a list just in case we decide we wanna take some more from you. Uh, that's kind of what his argument seemed to me to be arguing for. And so I would offer the contrary view that uh, Senator Rarick, I think you're, we've got a conundrum going here. I think it seems like it should be solvable, but we also don't uh, need a view of government that government should just keep lists of everything they can in case some legislature down the road might want to go after anybody that owns a parcel of land or anybody that owns this or that gun or this vehicle or that piece of machinery or asset. And that's what uh, I think we're hearing being argued. And I, I just that don't think that's an appropriate place for government to uh, use as, as the reason to keep lists around in case some future legislature wants to tax or outlaw or harm uh, private individual citizens. And uh, they're, they're the they're the people that make up the government in the first place. Senator Westrom, that uh, spells out many reasons exactly why I decided to bring this here for a hearing. Um, and I think we've had a really good uh, debate mm -hmm. on this. Um, since we have uh, two more bills on the committee, here's what I'm proposing to the members. Um, I propose to lay this bill on the table for the time being. I think we've got a potential amendment from Senator Anderson he'd like uh, worked on. I think uh, between me and Senator Rarick, something about maybe limiting to names and 10 years, that amendment might be worthwhile. I think we'd like to give DHS a couple of days to come for sure with their citations and their concrete authority uh, to your point, Senator Westrom, so that we're not going off of what ifs and I thinks uh, that we've got concrete information. So my proposal would be to uh, lay this on the table till Thursday. Uh, we do have the big veterans bill coming up on Thursday, but I would take this first and uh, have hopefully amendments and further information ready to go at that point. Thank you, Chairman. Senator Latz. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't counter what Senator Westrom was suggesting that I was suggesting because he, he misunderstood what I was saying. Uh, my point is that I don't think that we as a legislature can, uh, as a practical matter or constitutionally, uh, bind a future legislature. Uh, so uh, I, I think that's, it's just kind of a, a non-starter in terms of, uh, of that. And certainly this attempt to broaden this to all sorts of lists of property, held or owned by people, that's just a red herring. That's not what this is about at all. Um, but uh, this bill does a lot more than its proponents say they want to do. Um, and so I think it's wise to get this additional information and see if there's appropriate restrictions that don't conflict with federal law. Um, and uh, uh, I think the other one thing that's that hasn't been determined here yet is the question of, of, of uh, being more confident that the data, once it's no longer being retained as required by federal law, what happens with it? Uh, having some confidence that the department will in fact delete the data that is no longer necessary to retain. Um, so if, if that's the goal here, then let's just say that, that you know, let's add something uh, that says that once the data is no longer subject to the federal mandatory retention period, then the department shall, within the next number of months or, or something like that, shall uh, delete the data, permanently delete the data, unless the legislature, you know, unless we want to think that, you know, there's some other reason to hang on to the data for statistical purposes. Um, but, uh, you know, I understand that concern. I understand the fear of people that the legislature might somewhere down the road do something they don't like 
or undo something they've already done that they were happy with. Um, but I don't think it's wise from a policy standpoint to attempt to bind a, a future legislature in that way. And I don't think we constitutionally could do that anyway. Before I lay this on the table, last word to Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, I think it's wise to lay the bill on the table. Uh, we need a little more information before we make any further discussion. Having said that, there's in our packets a uh, stapled three or four pages that says SF-182-TA on the top of it. And I just wanted to know who's the author of this? Because it doesn't have any depiction of who wrote it. It seems to be rather uh, a critical analysis of federal law, a state recovery background, data retention concern. I'd like to know who wrote it so. I'm gonna have my committee administrator oh. track down uh, who provided that handout. Mr. Chair, I'm sure uh, my LA can help us uh, figure that out uh, before we get to here Thursday. Uh, Senator Limmer, it appears to have been a handout provided to us from DHS. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator uh, Limmer. It, it may behoove all of us to, uh, whenever we have witnesses, uh, to have them identify where or when they hand us information. Uh, it looks like a very thorough description of this subject, but um, it may not have all the answers we're seeking. So it's uh, good to know where, the, where it comes from. Thank you. Agreed, Senator Limmer, thank you. Uh, with that members, Senate file 182 is laid on the table till Thursday. And thank you, Senator Rarick for uh, being here today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We will move to Senate file 3087 from Senator Bigham. Senator Brigham, welcome to the committee. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, thank you for hearing this bill, um, Senate file 3087. Appreciate the committee's time and um, attention today. So this uh, bill deals with the Safe at Home program, uh, which as we, as we know is uh, the state's address confidentiality program for people uh, with very high safety needs. Um, it began in 2007, and now um, there are approximately 40 states with an address confidentiality program. Uh, most safe at home participants are uh, victims of crime and abuse and use the safe at home uh, address, allows them to um, go about their daily life without um, you know, living in, in fear that the person is gonna, um, that they do fear is going to have access to their address. Um, we did hear this bill last year. Uh, and so I am going in this committee and I'm going to um, turn it over to Nicole Freeman with the office of the Minnesota Secretary of State's office. Ms. Freeman, uh, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record and then begin your testimony. Welcome. Sure. Thank you, Chair Matthews uh, and Senator Bigum and members. Uh, my name is Nicole Freeman, and I serve as the Government Relations Director for the Office of the Secretary of State. Um, just for uh, reference for um, committee members, um, a few other members of our staff are on uh, the Zoom as well. Um, so Diana Umadon, uh, the Safe at Home Director, is on, as well as Deputy Secretary of State Julie Struther. Um, so they can help answer any questions that you might have, too. 
Um, and then there's a few members on from um, Hennepin County and um, Representative Mako as well. Uh, so the Safe at Home program assists participants by forwarding their mail to them. It helps them with interactions with third parties who need to understand legal compliance, problems with third party stakeholders, and by helping participants understand how to use their Safe at Home address to stay safe. Uh, the changes in Senate File 30. 87 uh, made in coordination with community and county partners will improve the program's effectiveness, particularly for those participants who uh, purchase real property. The first section of the bill clarifies the definition of mail and what packages the program is required to forward. The second section adds the words or entity uh, to 5B.05 to clarify that program notices that a participant might provide do apply to both individuals or entities. Um, it makes changes to allow a participant to specify whether they need to protect both their name and address or just, just their address as well. The third section modifies the language around notices landlords might post uh, to clarify they should not post anything that displays a program participant's name. This change was made in consultation with and approval of the Minnesota Multi-Housing Association, the Minnesota Alliance on Crime, Violence Free Minnesota, and our over 100 partner organizations. The remaining sections make modifications to 13.045 to improve the processes of home purchase, government data maintenance, and notices provided to government entities. Um, Hennepin County, uh, particularly Amber Bouget, is going to provide testimony for these changes. So with that, Chair, thank you for hearing this bill. Um, and I'll stand for questions or can turn it over to um, Ms. Bouget, whichever you prefer. Ms. Bouget, I believe you're on Zoom. Yes. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Bingham, Bingham and committee members. I'm Amber Bouget. I'm the County Recorder and Registrar of Titles for Hennepin County. I'm also the co-chair of the Minnesota County Recorders Association Legislative Committee, which is part of the Minnesota Association of County Officers. This bill is also supported by the Minnesota Association of County Officers and is included, included in its legislative platform. I'd like to thank the Secretary of State's office for the opportunity to work with them to identify technical changes to the safe at home language to help government entities better serve safe at home participants. I'd also like to thank Senator Bigham and Senator Franzen for authoring this bill. I will begin with a brief description of the safe at home general notice. The theme of this bill as it relates to the safe at home general notice is tailoring the protection of for, afforded to the safe at home general notice participant. And it does this in three ways. First, it allows the Secretary of State's office to create a form to collect the information local governments need to accurately identify and protect safe at home general notice participants. For example, if we have a safe at home general notice participant with a common name, such as Charles Johnson, we may not be able to identify the records that need protecting without additional identifying information, like a date of birth. Second, it requires the Safe at Home General Notice participant to specify the location data to be protected. And third, it creates a default that the participant's location will be protected, but not the identity of the participant unless specifically requested by the participant. For these last two items, it is sometimes not feasible to protect a name or work location in county records. For example, if a county employee who interacts with the public would submit a safe at home general notice, the name and work location of that employee may be found in hundreds of government records. At the same time, we understand that participants most desire to protect a specific location for safety purposes. This bill clarifies that protection of speci specified location only will be the default unless otherwise requested. I will now briefly cover the changes applicable to the real property notice. A real property notice applies prospectively to real property records. These records are often public and important to commerce. It protects a safe at home participants identity in connection with a specific property. 
The proposed changes to the real property notice portions of the statute clarify that the real property notice is not just notice to the county recorder, but also applies to all real property records held by a government entity, such as assessment and taxation records. The amendments clarify that the real property notice, instead of the general notice, applies to real, prop real property data outside of the county recorder's office. This includes data about real property held by other government entities, such as a city holding assessment or permit data. In all cases, the real property notice applies prospectively to new data re re created. These changes also provide for more effective government. The specific changes include changing the definition of real property records to now include data on assessments, data on real property or personal property taxation, and other data on real property. The next changes replace the reference to county recorder with government entity. This is to make it clear that the real property notice provisions apply to a government entity who maintains real property records. There are also some minor administrative changes with respect to the information in the notice as well as a notification of term termination. The final change is allowing sharing of information between government entities for assessment and taxation purposes. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to testify this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, any questions from any of our committee members? Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, um, I guess I'm, I'm more, I'm also interested in any unintended consequences of this bill. Uh, looks like we're trying to just tune up a few areas, but what are, what are the downfalls or the unintended consequence? Uh, uh, maybe to the Secretary of State representative. Um, then I have a follow-up. Ms. Freeman. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chair uh, and Senator Westrom. Um, I will give I will uh, give a crack at the answer and then um, open it up for uh, um, Diana Umadon to follow up if I missed anything. Um, you are correct in saying that most of these changes are technical in nature. Um, this bill has been around in a very similar form um, since 2020, and so we've uh, and work on that began uh, on this bill began before that time, and so we've had several years to really meet with partners and fine tune um, exactly what technical changes would be needed to um, to shore this up. Um, so I think that as, as um, NS Senator Brigham stated, the, the program's been around since 2007. So this is a sort of an ongoing um, process as we are finding you know, little things that could be changed. So um, I don't know of any uh, pitfalls that have been identified um, as I think we have identified pitfalls with previous versions of the bill as we're kind of, we're working on it. Um, and have worked through those um, to get some clean language. But uh, if Diana or Julie, you have any other um, comments, feel free to chime in. Ms. Ms. Freeman, do you have, uh, can you uh, recall for us maybe the one or two biggest pitfalls we identified previously that you think this version has fixed from before? Uh, so I think that, uh, what the bill is fixing are some of the pitfalls um, that have been identified, frankly. Um, there's uh, the, the data can get, um, as Ms. Bouget testified to, the data uh, with employees um, as well as uh, members of the public that are receiving county or other government services uh, can get a little bit tricky. And so this um, puts more flexibility in the hands of the participant um, to tell us what data they want um, to be kept private. Um, to protect their to protect their safety, so I think that's what the okay and, Senator Brigham. Yeah, and Mr. Chair, um, to the, to that question, I think um, not fixing this has an unintended consequence because a lot of law enforcement um, are in this program for obvious reasons. They don't want their personal address and information disseminated and, and known. Um, and so in Minnesota, we have a lot of Andersons and Johnsons and Larsons. 
and you want to make sure that that person um, is the accurate person they're said, you know, to be protecting. So I think uh, that reason is a, is a large reason to make sure that it's not only for law enforcement, but victims of domestic abuse, um, that we're protecting their information um, as the best we can. And the, these technical fixes allow for that. Senator Westrom, are there a lot of Westrom's in this state? <laughs> uh, believe it or not, Mr. Chair, there's quite a few. And uh, uh, while you asked, I'll give you just a little more history. Uh, <laughs> it was uh, Swenson, uh, was what I was uh, told when I was young by my dad, but reminded by a great aunt, or uh, actually at a, at a recent funeral uh, this past winter, uh, that our forefathers, when they came over, Westrom was Swenson, but Westrom means by the West Brook in Norway. And that's, oh. uh, the name was changed. Uh, I keep being asked from people in Albert Lee, if I'm related to them, there's Westrom's down there up in Clearbrook. There was a George Westrom professional baseball player. So when I went to college, I could pretend I was related to him, although he was UM. But uh, I digress, Mr. Chair. Thank you for asking. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyways, Mr. Chair, uh, to the Secretary of State or Senator Bigham, it, it seems like a maybe rational bill to be moving forward with, uh, but I guess I'm not comfortable with us uh, with, without great scrutiny, just being sure what we're making private. And uh, Senator Bigham, uh, the Secretary of State's office, uh, Ms. Freeman, uh, I've sat in on court arguments of the Secretary of State's office trying to keep general data, voter data, so-called private and out of the hands of other groups for groups that are trying to offer scrutiny to making sure the voter rolls are accurate. And so while the intention of making stuff private is laudable in a narrow, limited way, uh, it seems to me that there's concerns I have that maybe the Secretary of State's office is trying to use the statute to hide behind in other cases. And so I want, I guess, to know from you why, what, what, what separates this from the no, more normal data roles that uh, there's lawsuits over? Courts have ordered you to, to make some of that information public and you still haven't. And so what, what separates this bill from, from general data? And uh, I've got concerns when we keep making it all private and nobody can verify what's going on. And it leads to a lot of unanswered questions. And so maybe you can help shed some light on that. Ms. Freeman, Ms. Senator Bigham. Yeah, Mr. Chair, thank you. And thank you, Senator Westrom. One, I would just like to say it passed uh, the, the last year passed unanimously out of the House and has very broad bipartisan support. And it's because the information it's protecting is for domestic uh, victims of domestic abuse and members of law enforcement that are enrolled in the program. So that's the data we're trying to um, protect and have the most accurate. And these technical changes allow for that. But if um, Ms. Freeman wants to um, add on to that or whatever, feel free. Ms. Freeman. Sure, sure. Uh, thank you, Chair Matthews, Senator Westrom. Um, just to clarify, this, these changes only apply to participants in the Safe at Home program and data relating to them. Um, the, the program does include um, protecting voters who are participants in the Save at Home program. It, in, it, in, it does include protecting their address um, as, part of the prob, as part of the program. Um, but I think uh, the data that you might be speaking about is in a, is, is in a, in a different database um, and isn't brought up in this bill. Um, the sections of law that we're editing are, are particular to the Safe at Home program and um, data relating to those Safe at Home participants. Senator Wester. So, Mr. Chair, um, thank you, uh, Ms. Freeman, for that uh, answer. Um, how many, how many people are we roughly 
uh, saying this would cover on the voter rolls? And what would be the way then uh, a third party could uh, authenticate or verify or audit and check uh, that this is only protecting this narrow little group of voters and not a uh, harbor for other other voters that nobody would ever know about. What, who, who can verify this and how big of a database are we talking? Ms. Freeman. Sure, um, so the, the number of safe at home participants changes um, all the time as people are moving in and out of the state. Um, their situations might change whether they're you know in a particular um, situation where they fear for their safety um, or if things might have resolved. Um, lots of different circumstances there. Um, in 2001, we had 4,489 participants um, that were served. Uh, so again, this data is a, a really small, it, it's, again, we're not talking about voter data um, specifically with this, these technical changes here. Um, we're talking about um, data of safe at home participants. Um, yes. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair. Um so the second part of my question, what, how, how, how can somebody verify this besides just one person, the Secretary of State? Who, who else can, can, can at least audit and, and, and cross check and verify that everything's accurate and in, 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 in there? But did you say 2001 was 4,000 some? 2021. 2021. Sorry. I may have misspoke. Okay. Ms. And, and, and so, oh, Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, um, is is that a is that an approximate average? Are we talking three, four, five thousand people? Generally, it fluctuates, but is that a, 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 an accurate range to presume? Ms. Freeman, thank you, Chair. I apologize for jumping in there. Um, yes, uh, I know that um, in twenty twenty there were um, the the numbers change all the time, um, and but approximately I would say four thousand is probably the average over the last seven. Um, several years. Okay. Yes. And Mr. Chair, Ms. Freeman, Senator can you Westbrook. answer the second part of my question? So, um, Ms. Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, if someone has questions about um, particular voters, um, I believe that there are, I would have to get back to you on exactly how those numbers are, um, the safe at home participants are accounted for. Um, I uh, previously administered elections in Washington, so I can speak to, you know, we would get, um, we would receive ballots that were voted by safe at home participants, which are tied to a particular precinct. Um, so we do have that information and that data. Uh, on a precinct level, um, where these safe at home participants live. Um, I know as a program, um, as someone enters the program, maybe um, Diana could chime in a little bit on this too, um, in order for a program participant to um, enter the program, there's identity verification and other um, steps in the process. And so um, I guess I'm not sure particularly what sort of auditing you're, you're speaking about. Senator Westrom. Well, well, Mr. Chair, uh, Ms. Freeman, uh, your, your answer makes me think of just maybe a little bit more of an illustration. Let's just talk about the, uh, the, the Jane Doe of the world. Uh, let's just say Jill Anderson is in uh, Washington County and the safe at home uh, on this protected voter roll. Uh, walk us through how the election judges in, in uh, Cottage Grove or wherever she lives is are going to know that she's a legitimate voter on the voter roll, but you need to be quiet about her information so nobody knows who or where she lives. And uh, so if you could walk through that, it would be helpful. So we actually understand how this is gonna interplay. But I guess to explain my prior question a little more, um, let's just say you're, you're, you made a, you've made a mistake or decided um, snow skiing is more important uh, and somebody just in your office hasn't gotten to cleaning up this role, and 2,000 of those 4,000 people are old, safe at home voters that either don't exist anymore, have moved out of the state, passed on, 
or don't legitimately belong on this database, but who else can find that out to scrub or challenge your decision as the Secretary of State's office to protect or hide this data from anybody else? Who, who would be a third party that could audit a check and balance that could say, no, uh, this is old information. It should have been off the protected list two years ago. Ms. Freeman. Sure, um, I'm actually gonna turn it over to Deputy Secretary of State, uh, Julie Struther. Ms. Strother, I believe you're online. I am Mr. Chair, Julie Strother, Deputy Secretary of State with the Office of the Minnesota Secretary of State. Um, Diana Uman, our program director is here as well. Anyone enrolling in the Safe at Home program um, is required to register to vote through the Safe at Home program and our director then remove their information from the public voter roll. So no one shows up in the polling place in the program um, to vote in person. They all vote absentee through the program. As it relates to auditing, our staff does do a report um, and a check after every election to make sure that anyone um, who voted through the program did not vote in the polling place on election day. Um, and further, as it relates to auditing, I would just note that the office has been um, audited by the legislative auditor um, as part of our financial audit. They also did a data practices audit of the Safe at Home program, and we can get you uh, the information on that audit if you'd like as well. Senator Westrom. And, and, and Mr. Chair, um, to the testifier, so is, is that the only people that would check and cross-check the list or, 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 or anybody else that can look at it? It doesn't sound like there's anybody outside of your office that could, could check it or get uh, privileged access to, to verify. Is that correct? Ms. Strother, do you want that one, or Senator Bigham? Well, Mr. Mr. Chair, Senator West from the Office of Legislative Auditor is outside of the Secretary of State's office. Ms. Strother, do you have a, uh, any additional answer? Mr. Chair, uh, no, I would say the Office of the Legislative Auditor has had access to the program. Our staff um, is required by law to do that check um, post-election, and then the only other uh, law enforcement can have access to um, certain program participant information through the um, BCA's 24-hour uh, um, on-call procedure as well, but voting information in particular, there's a requirement in state law to review um, voter records after every election. Um, and then again, um, we have been examined by the legislative body. Senator Westbrook. So, so Mr. Chair um, and Senator Bigham, the set legislative auditor uh, and, and is, is a spot check. I don't believe, and maybe the testifier can clarify this, is the legislative auditor automatically cross-checking or double-checking every after every election that you've scrubbed the rolls, or is that a spot check? My understanding is they would do a audit here and there, but they would not be the the one's in charge of double checking that, that it's done, but can you clarify that? Who is that? I missed Senator Westrom. Who is that? Uh, to the testifier, Jody, uh, I forget her last name. Uh, Ms. Strother, Julie Strother. Julie, Julie. Mr. Strother. Chair, Senator, um, it is a spot check from the legislative auditor whenever we are up for our regular audit. It's part of their data practices. Um, additional component of the financial audit, they've looked at the Safe at Home program. I will note that this bill doesn't actually make any new data private and it actually um, uh, makes uh, some data more shareable um, as opposed to um, more protected um, at, for the reasons that the previous testifier stated. And it doesn't change anything about the current procedures around voting through the Safe at Home program. I hope that that is helpful. Senator Westrow. Mr. Chair, um, it, it, it is a little helpful, but uh, Mr. Chair, I, I would have big concerns. I don't know what the plan is for this bill. Is it to be laid over and worked on? Or what, what is your plan, uh, Mr. Chair, is, if it's being voted on today? Uh, Mr. Uh, Senator Westrom, um, we had no other claims from committees, so the intent was going to uh, refer to general orders. So, so Mr. Chair, um, I would just make a final comment um, to the Julie uh, from the test secretary of state's office or, or Ms. Freeman, 
uh, referenced, well, state law requires them to scrub this and do that. Um, I've got a list in my office of dozens, hundreds uh, of so-called addresses that don't match up with mail-in ballots or absentee ballots. And yet the state law requires that to be done. And it appears that people have registered at school buildings and other erroneous locations as so-called residents, and yet they were on voter rolls. And so uh, I just don't have comfort that we're one person looking this over is so supposedly getting us the, 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 the exact scrutiny, Mr. Chair, the checks and balances of who's on these rolls. So I, I, I could not support this bill right now. Um, I would urge members to not pass it today. Uh, we don't need to pass more bills to make voter data uh, a place that nobody else can tell if it's accurate or, or not. And so I, I would raise that concern and urge you, Mr. Chair, to either lay this over or uh, members, uh, it's not ready to pass to the floor. Senator Bigham and then Senator Limmer. Senator Bigham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's just some, some final comments. One, I just want to be crystal clear that the Safe at Home program is not a voter roll program. So um, I just want to differentiate between that, nor do I feel that victims of domestic violence and law enforcement are utilizing this program to conspire to have election fraud. So um, that might be a new one. Um, this is an important program to protect victims of domestic abuse and members of law enforcement that are in this program. So there are technical changes for clarity and certainly um, would appreciate the committee's support as it had last time, uh, last session on the way out. Senator Limmer. Mr. Chairman, um, I remember these bills over the years as they came forward. Um, Sarah Westrom has raised some questions that kind of reminded me of some of the past discussion. I've always supported these types of bills. Uh, I think there are people that are legitimately, legitimately fearful of allowing their information, their location yeah. data to be revealed. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm looking at the clock. I'm not sure if we have enough time to fully do this. Plus, we've got another bill, I think, on the agenda. Um, I think some of this, some of the answers that Western, Senator Western is seeking um, maybe in his mind uh, have not been adequately answered. Uh, I think maybe we just need a little more time uh, to consider this bill. Um, I would suggest we lay the bill on the table, Mr. Chairman, and uh, see if we can't resolve our, our concerns about this and then at some future time, consider it. Okay, thank you, Senator Limmer. Senator Westrom, did you have a follow-up too? Mr. Chair, thank you for your indulgence. Senator Brigham, uh, and, and maybe Ms. Freeman, it, it seems to me that there could be a system at least put in place that through a court or a supervision or a, uh, a, a legislative committee could request such data, have it embargoed, or a, uh, a third party could petition the court for uh, viewing it and, and re reviewing it uh, with some parameters around it. And, and, and that's just not in this bill at all. Um, and, and so would you be open to something that would uh, allow for a check and balance, uh, not just one office to be so-called responsible to, to take care of it and just, just trust us. And if we get it wrong, you'll never know. Um, Mr. Senator Limmer actually made a motion to lay on the bill on the table and I uh, mistake, mistook that. Um, so I shouldn't have gone to you for more comment on that, Senator Westrom. Point of order. Can I Senator Latz. Mr. Chairman, I didn't, maybe I misheard, but I didn't hear a motion. I heard a suggestion um, from Senator Limmer. Uh, without him saying he moves that we do that, uh, it's an option for all of us to consider. Um, and I'd like to be heard on the bill itself. 
just seems to me that the questions raised by Senator Westrom are not directly relevant to the changes that are being proposed in the bill itself. If Senator Westrom has other concerns about how data is handled in the Secretary of State's office that's intended to protect victims of sexual abuse and stalking and law enforcement officers, um, he's certainly entitled to introduce a bill to address those concerns. Uh, but the points that he's raising are irrelevant to the proposed changes in the bill that's before us. Um, so I don't see why any additional information would be helpful, except to have the effect of hijacking this bill for some unknown purpose. Mr. Chair. Senator Limmer, would you be willing to temporarily withdraw the motion to let Senator Bigham answer a question and then I can return back uh, to you for that? Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll withdraw what was described as my suggestion uh, and, um, and we'll, uh, we'll continue the discussion. Senator Bigham. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll reiterate what Senator Latz was gonna say is that the concerns that are being raised are, are not involved in this bill. They would be separate from this technical bill that again protects the address of people that are in high safe um, safety situations, such as victims of domestic abuse and law enforcement to protect them and their family um, from, um, being known uh, to people that may want to do harm. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, this is a, a very innocuous bill. This is a very technical bill, but important bill. So um, I'm actually going to ask that it be recommended to pass, be referred to general orders. This is Senate file 3087. And I'm going to ask for a roll call. All right, Senator Bigham has made that motion uh, that the bill be recommended to pass and referred to general orders. Is there any more discussion? And I would ask for the record to be reported in the journal, Mr. Chair, and I have my hand raised. All right, are there three hands? One, oh, two. I'm not raising for that. Seeing three hands, uh, it will be recorded. Any further discussion? Mr. Chair. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, a uh, motion to lay it on the table would be a higher a priority, uh, and so I would move that, Mr. Chair. Senator Westrom moves to lay the bill on the table. All those in favor of roll that? Call. Rolls for a roll call, and it be recorded in the journal. Senator Latz moves for a roll call, and that it be printed in the journal. Are there three hands? Seeing three hands, there will be a roll call. Uh, the secretary or the uh, the clerk will take the roll. Chair Matthews. Yes. Vice Chair Limmer. Yes. Uh, Ranking Member Bigham. No. Senator Anderson. Yes. Senator Westrom. Yes. Senator Johnson. Yes. Senator Carlson. No. Uh, Senator Latz. No. All right. The bill is laid on the table and uh, I can't promise to put it on Thursday, Senator Brigham, but we'll revisit it for uh, as soon as we can. And if uh, the Secretary of State's office can help reach out to some of our members in the meantime, I think that would be helpful. Appreciate that. Mr. Chair. Senator Anderson. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Bigham, uh, you mentioned law enforcement, uh, concerned about that. I, if you have other, if you have law enforcement that would come forward to testify, that would be great. Um, Mr. Chair? Senator Bigham. As a matter of fact, MPPOA supported it last time and made a personal call to the chair of state government finance. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Bigham. Mr. Chairman? 
Senator Latz. Any chance we can get the list that Senator Westrom is retaining in his office of registered, supposedly registered voters so that we can audit it for its, uh, its validity for the purpose for which he's offering the information? Uh, thank you, Senator Latz. We're going to move on to the final bill on our agenda. Uh, Senator Rood, thank you for your patience. We have Senate file 3063. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe there's an amendment. Uh, thank you, Senator Rood. We have an A2 amendment in the packets. If uh, Senator Bigham moves the A2 amendment, uh, this is not the first committee this bill has been in, so it is not an author's amendment. Uh, do you want to quickly describe the amendment, Senator Rood, or? or uh, uh, Mr. Chair, this Senator is um, um, Ms. Primo. Um, did this, um, she went through the bill and noticed that there was a discrepancy there. And so it's really pretty a technical amendment that she drafted for us. Uh, Ms. Primo, are you still online? Do you have a brief description for us? Mr. Chair and members, um, yes, I am. And this bill removes a reference to trespass provisions. Um, and that was somewhat superfluous and inaccurate because one of the statutes cited at 1.17 doesn't necessarily just include trespass violations. So it does not change the substance of the bill, just Clara makes it much more clear to understand. Thank you, Ms. Primo. Any discussion to the A2 amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, aye. no. The amendment is adopted. Senator Root. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and with me today, I have three testifiers that are just here. I, I think they're online and they, they just are here to answer questions today. So this can be um, relatively easy. So um, I know you all know the uh, an incredible economic impact that snowmobiling has to um, the state of Minnesota, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. If you came to my district last weekend, you would see that it was like an anthill full of snowmobilers and the, and the uh, motels are full and the restaurants are full and uh, it's, it's such an economic driver. Um, our snowmobile clubs have done a phenomenal job. Um, you know that it's an all volunteer um, um, system throughout the state of Minnesota and uh, the DNR and the local government units of government, they have spent countless hours on educating uh, snowmobiling and um, signage and public service announcements to stay on the trails. And for the most part, we have um, uh, great folks that come up to our areas and snowmobile, but there's a few bad actors in the group and they make it increasingly hard for us. Um, we have private landowners that are kind enough to allow the snowmobile trails to go through their properties. And um, the trespass has become um, quite an issue in the area. Um, and so the snowmobiles and the DNR and um, the local units of government have come to us to ask us to increase the fines on the trespass. Um, you know, that big open field that looks wonderful to make your trail over, to track over, and, and it's so inviting, but that could be a farmer's winter wheat field and then you trespass and the farmer is not very likely to have us come there again. And so the trail system is broken easily. So they've come before us to uh, ask with our help to increase the penalties, hoping that that will help um, stop the trespassing. And with that, it's a, it's a pretty simple ask. Thank you, Senator Rood. Uh, is there any discussion on the bill? Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, just uh, Senator Rood, what are we going from and to? It looks like $100, $500, and $1,000. What What are we at now? I wasn't clear to me. Senator for, Rood. For fines. Um, I believe it about triples the fines. Uh, Senator Westrom, it looks like it's removing 100, 200, and 500, and inserting 250, 500, and 1,000. Okay. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, um, I guess maybe to one of the testifiers, you said they'd be here to answer questions. Um, a few weeks ago, I was out with my uh, son and a friend of his in class and his dad, and uh, uh, we were 
doing a trail ride and uh, the trip took a little longer because uh, the trail was, wasn't was fully clear because there'd been some snow on the drifts and uh, the, the gentleman who was leading, who's done a lot of riding, um, got going down a driveway that looked like a trail until we got a half mile or mile down the road. And then he realized uh, the tracks he was following was somebody else's tracks and it was off the trail. And so uh, I know how easy this can be to happen. And uh, I guess I would just be a little cautious for us to put situations like that into trespass um, and then a $250 fine, but maybe somebody address that that's here to testify. Uh, seems like a pretty big jump. Um, who would like to take, I see uh, Mr. Doug Franzen online raised his hand. Uh, Mr. Franzen. Mr. Chair, I don't understand why you would uh, go to Chair. Senator Rude to answer the question on her own bill. I'm fairly certain she's perfectly capable of answering her own question. Senator Rude, do you have a response? Oh, Mr. Chair, first? I'm Senator Westrom, yes. Um, I've been snowmobiling since 1972, so you probably wouldn't like to snowmobile on the, the sleds that I rode uh, at that time. Um, pretty crude, but um, so Senator Westrom, I don't, um, this is for trespass. And when you, when you trespass, you really mean to trespass. And I don't think there's a CO out there that would, if you accidentally went um, on uh, a path that you didn't realize, that wouldn't um, talk to you about staying on the trail and where you were supposed to go. And there's certainly all sorts of uh, trail maps out there that are really marked. And so I, I, I think that, that um, that's an issue that we don't see happen very often. Some people do, um, you could go down a driveway, but I'm sure that when you realize that you had made a mistake, you would turn around. And uh, you know, we, we have our COs that are, um, I think, certainly capable of making those types of decisions. Mr. Franzen, do you have uh, additional Maybe. answer to provide? Very good. That's what, that's yes, what I was Mr. asking Chair, for, Mr. Member. Chair. Yeah. The, um, Please introduce yourself the for the record answer. and then proceed. Yes, I'm sorry. My name is Doug Franzen. I represent the Minnesota United Snowmobilers Association. We're the people who develop, maintain, and protect the trails. And as Senator Reed said, we're volunteers. And we have about 22,000 miles of trail throughout the state, um, most of it on private land. Um, officers, conservation officers, and deputies have what they call, and they hold tightly to, something called officer discretion. Uh, if your group were stopped by a conservation officer, and that con you explained what was happening. Uh, I doubt very much there would be any ticket or civil penalty given uh, for inadvertent mistakes. What we're looking at is, as Senator Root said, those bad apples who the current law is inadequate to deter. Uh, to ruin someone's winter wheat intentional or not, it, you know, if they have a fun time, they'll pay a hundred bucks. But we have found the uh, current penalties for bad actors to be insufficient. And in fact, a lot of our people and a number of senators have suggested that we are too modest in the increase. I hope that's responsive to your question, Senator Wenstrom. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, uh, that, that's helpful. Uh, Mr. Franson, just maybe you could point me to the language or, or Senator Root that would give that officer the, the, the first warning. It doesn't look to me like it would be a warning. It would be uh, discretion. You could get the fine though. Um, in the situation I laid out, I mean, that's, that's just, that's a real life example four, four weeks ago. Um, and and the, uh, the, the, certainly that's what happened. They, they turned around, the leader did, and said, I, I got off trail because it's a little hard to tell where this trail goes. And he was looking at his map multiple times. So, but, but I was trespassing. So Mr. Franson, 
uh, is that trespassing exempt, uh, a mistake, uh, and, or, or do, you, do we have sufficient language in there that it has to be intentional or repeated? Um, because I think that's a different scenario than if somebody makes a mistake, is still trespassing, but uh, corrects it or is taking actions to correct it. I, I don't see that in the language, but but maybe you can point me to it. Well, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Westrom. Uh, uh, Senator Rood. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator first. Westrom, I think you see on line 2.2, the peace officer may issue a citation. It does not say he must issue a citation. And so while uh, we don't specifically talk about officer discretion, I think that that, um, um, the only time you see on three or 2.10, if there is um, damage to property, then he must uh, send a written explanation of the extent. So I, I think we do give discretion by saying may online uh, 2.2. So Senator Westrom. Um, Mr. Chair, Senator Rood, but it, it doesn't get to the intent of the trespasser. And so would you be open to language that says uh, something about the trespasser's intent? Um, if they've done it repeatedly, it's, it's one thing, but if you're there and you happen to be caught in the circumstance that you either haven't corrected it or haven't learned yet or figured it out, um, I'd, I'd be concerned about that. And so I wonder if we could work on some language that would at least clarify so a first offense if the intent wasn't, uh, didn't know or should have, I mean, there's language in law a lot of times that says, knew or should have known or intended or uh, other words like that that are commonly used to help establish what was going on because um, I think that would be a better better balance if, if you're open to that. Well, Senator, what, Mr. Chair? Senator Rood, I can go to answer. I also uh, have a note that Senate Council is happy to explain some statutes too. Um, your Thank, you. Thank you, Senator. Mr. Chair, that would be fine. Uh, Ms. Primo. Mr. Chair and members, um, the statutes that are referenced are all statutes in current law. So there's no new um, type of violation. Um, it, it's it's really about giving the conservation officers the authority to issue a civil citation, but the underlying conduct is already prohibited. Some of them are misdemeanors. I think some of them are petties. I don't have all the statutes in front of me, unfortunately. Anything to add to that, Senator Rood? No, I think the, the, the bill is very clear in, in its intent. We also online have a member from the DNR, uh, Mr. Gorecki, who raised his hand. Would you like to answer this question? Please introduce yourself for the record. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, committee members. Thank you. I appreciate it. My name is Captain Robert Gorecki. I'm the Northeast Regional Enforcement Manager for the Department of Natural Resources. And just to clarify Senator Westrom's uh, comments or concerns, the burden of proof is still belongs to the state of Minnesota to prove guilt. Um, if you go to Minnesota statute uh, 97A.315, uh, the person has to knowingly disregard property, uh, prohibited trespassing signs or be notified person by the landowner or lessee not to trespass. Otherwise, of course, there's the agricultural uh, land trespass as well. So that is what it gets to, uh, like Senator Rood explained. Uh, the discretion still is with the officer. We would, of course, take the, uh, of course, take the totality of the circumstances of the incident in the, into consideration. And again, the burden of proof is still on the department and the state of Minnesota to prove guilt, uh, whether it's a civil or a criminal uh, trespass citation. So um, it doesn't change any of the trespass wording or laws or the uh, knowing or not knowing. It's just an enhanced uh, civil penalty, which ultimately gives all law enforcement officers just some additional tools to work for uh, making sure that uh, the public is safe and property owners' property rights are protected and honored, um, like Senator Runas explained. Senator Westrom, does that answer your question? Uh, it, it, it is uh, helpful, Mr. Chair, uh, to the officer. Uh, so is your, am I hearing your testimony correct that uh, a property that is, although you're being tres trespassing, uh, if it's not marked or if you have not been warned 
by the owner, you're saying then there, there's not a legal trespass such that you couldn't issue a citation. Did I understand you correctly? So before I go to uh, Officer Gorecki, we have blown way over time and we're gonna hit a hard stop here in just a few minutes because we have another committee time slot coming. I was hoping to pass at least one bill out today. I will go three for three if uh, that's what it's gonna require, but I want members to keep that in mind. We're gonna have to hit a hard stop in about four more minutes. So uh, Officer Gorecki, uh, if you could answer, please. Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, uh, thank you. The, the definition of trespass has not changed. So again, they have to knowingly uh, trespass, pass uh, no trespassing signs as legally marked or be told by the landowner to leave or under the agricultural trespass, if you are on an agricultural field or other property that has worked for crops or for livestock, that does not need to be posted. So the definitions of trespassing have not changed and under this, uh, uh, Senate bill will not change, just the enhanced penalties for civil penalties. Senator Westrom, is that satisfying? Last question, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Mr. Westrom. Franson talked about the damages of uh, driving across winter wheat. Uh, Mr. Franson, uh, my understanding is that there would be a civil suit that could also be brought against somebody that caused that damage uh, in addition to the penalty or your, your testimony made me think that the penalty is being enhanced so you can compensate that landowner for the damage. And uh, I, I don't think that's accurate, but, but maybe I misunderstood you. Um, my understanding is that the fine will be there plus the landowner could go after somebody private for, for civil damages uh, if they've wrecked their winter wheat or, or other crops. But can you help clarify that? Mr. Franzen, quickly, please. Yes, Mr. Senator, Mr. Chairman, Senator Westrom, you are correct. Uh, there is a separate, separate right of the landowner to recover. Uh, if there were not, the, you, the landowner would suffer damage in the tens of thousands of dollars in some cases uh, and a hundred or $200 civil penalty would not make him whole, but uh, if we could prove, if the state can prove a trespass, uh, you know, that, that the landowner is entitled to damages. But again, the landowner has to prove up those damages. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Senator Mr. Limmer. Mr. Chairman, I move that Senate File 3063 as amended be recommended to pass and move to the Senate floor. Thank you, Senator Limmer. Uh, hearing no further discussion, all in favor of that motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Motion prevails. The bill is passed. Thank you, members. This committee stands adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. <laughs>